morning. How are we doing this morning? Are we doing all right? Well, that's good. Guess what this morning is? Sunday. No, it's Sunday. Yeah, that's the right answer. Rick. Yeah. Rick, Rick. Excuse me. Can I interrupt you for a second? What's this morning? Okay. How do you know that? How do you know that? The pastor rode his motorcycle to church this morning. So, 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 so it's the first sign of spring, that, and and I'm thankful for the rain because it is a fancy motorcycle. You wouldn't believe looking at it that it's 11 years old, would you? Um, I'm thankful for the rain because with all the rain, it washed all that white stuff off the road, and now I don't have to wash my motorcycle when I get home and clean all that calcium off it. Good morning, Sonny. I saw you brought the boss with you today. Good morning, Caleb. Oh, oh, okay. All right. Blaming the kids again. I tell you, he's blaming the kids again. It's good to be here. Um, last week, we finished up Acts 14, and we finished it up on a high note, rejoicing as, as uh, Paul and Barnabas shared with the church at Antioch that had sent them out all the things the Lord has done. What do you think they talked about? Do you think he talked about having to sneak out of town in the middle of the night because they were going to kill him? Or <laughs> they talked about Jesus. Or the time where they almost killed him and they thought they had killed him. They didn't talk about that, did they? What did they talk about? They talked about the things that God had done. How God's hand was with them the whole way and he delivered them through everything. Well, you got got uh, special Sunday coming up in about four weeks. We call it Resurrection Sunday. And we rejoice because the tomb's empty. But let me share with you, that road to an empty tomb wasn't an easy one to walk. And so the next couple weeks, um, we're going we're gonna to sit at the foot of the cross. And we're going to listen to our Savior speak from the cross. And it's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to be difficult. But knowing that there is an empty tomb at the end of it, we should be able to say rejoice. And rejoice in what? That our Savior was willing to go through that. Not for His sake, not for his benefit, not for his gain, but for ours. So just sit with me at the foot of the cross for the next couple of weeks. And we'll, we'll take a look, listen, and talk about what you do. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful for Jesus. We're thankful for his willingness to walk the path that led to the cross. We're thankful that he doesn't rest in an empty in a tomb. The tomb is empty because he sits at the right. Lord, we serve a victorious Savior. We serve a Savior that isn't afraid to face the challenges, the trials, the tribulations in order to deliver the law. He didn't do it to condemn us. He did it to save us. And we are so thankful. As we worship you this morning, Lord, we ask that you would just make that impression upon our heart. Lord, it's hard to believe. It's hard to comprehend. It's hard to have absolute trust and faith that Jesus did it for us. Did it even when we didn't deserve. Lord, so as we worship you this morning, help us. Help us to raise thanksgiving and praise to your name for the gracious gift you gave us. For we come in Jesus' name. Amen. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. 
He has no form or comeliness when we see him. There is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned, every one, to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken, and they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, who has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and he made intercession for the transgressors. But he was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquity. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wound, we are healed. You know, we didn't get here by ourselves. I would be willing to bet that anybody that's accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior was told by somebody else. Was That message was shared with them. And we don't understand sometimes what the sacrifice they made to be able to share that message with us. But it is. It's it, you know, and some sometimes we're too intimidated to share that message. Sometimes we decide that it's not worth the effort because it's going to cost us something. But Christ set the standard pretty high. There isn't anything greater than laying down your life. And if you fall short of laying down your life to share with somebody else, you haven't given enough yet. You haven't given enough. So think about that. Think about what Christ did. We're gonna re we're reflecting on that today, but but think about what he went through. Bless this time, the reading of your word. May we be filled with the joy of serving the risen Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, please. Join me in the Gospel of Luke. We're going to be at chapter 23. We're going to begin on verse 26. This Gospel of Luke was written, they assume, less than 30 years after the crucifixion that we're just going through. And we're picking up on verse uh, 26, which is when Pilate turned Jesus over to the Roman guards take them for crucifixion. Luke chapter 23, beginning on verse 26. As they led him away, they seized one Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, and laid on him the cross to carry it behind Jesus. 
And there followed him a great multitude of the people and of the women who were mourning and lamenting for him. But turning to them, Jesus said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that had never borne a child and the breasts that had never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us and to the hills. Cover us. For if they do these things when the wood is green, what will happen when it's dry? Two others who were criminals were led away to uh, be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they, the Roman guards, cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by, watching. But the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, his chosen one, the soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offered him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him. This is the king of the Jews. Now one of the criminals who were hanged railed against him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. Uh, but the other rebuked him, saying, do, not, do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And so he said to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he, Jesus, said to him, Truly, I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. So ends the reading from the Gospel of Luke. Amen. Thank you. To get to Resurrection Sunday, we first have to walk to Golgotha. Is this something new? What did David say? Psalm 23, verse 4. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for your rod and your staff they come. Right? Before we get to what? The banquet that the Lord prepared in the, in the presence of his enemies, before his head was anointed with oil, before goodness and mercy followed him the days of his life, before he dwelled in the house of the Lord forever, he had to what? Walk through the valley. Folks, we're all going to be challenged. We're all going to face trials and tribulations. I'm sorry. I'd love to preach a health and wealth gospel, but that just isn't it. And, and you know, it's, it can be sobering. But it's worth it. James said, consider it all joy when you face trials of many kinds. That's hard to do, I can tell you. But it means that there's something on the other side that's worth your very life. There are some words Christ shared on that journey as he walked to the hill where he would be crucified. We're going to take in some of those words over the next couple of weeks. We're going to look at them. We're going to try, to try to understand how somebody who was so badly beaten and so badly uh, tortured could even comprehend 
and speak such grace and such mercy. It wasn't about him. It was always about us. As they led Jesus away, a man named Simon, who was from Cyrene, happened to be coming in from the countryside. Okay. Why was Simon coming in from the countryside? You can say it louder, Kevin. Oh. <laughs> Man, God does provide blessings, doesn't he? No. <laughs> Terry's, Terry's smiling back there. <laughs> Passover. They were coming into Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. We call it the Last Supper because it was the Last Supper that Christ served with his disciples. And, and when he was coming in from the countryside, the soldiers seized him and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. Why did they do that? Remember, don't give the Roman soldiers more credit than they deserve. Why did they do that? Because Christ was so badly beaten he couldn't carry it himself. And they didn't want him to die before he got to the hill because they had other things they wanted to do to him when they got him there. All they were doing was preserving their opportunity to, to torture him a little bit more. And Simon coming in from the countryside, hey, this guy looks good, let's grab him. Why, who was Simon? Do we know who Simon was? He was a follower of Christ, actually. The, that's what they tell us. It's not written here, but, but he was there and he came and, you know... Um, but the purpose was to make sure Jesus got there. Now, does God ever send us things to help us get through those difficult times? I think that uh, Simon didn't, probably didn't consider himself blessed, did he? Think of that task, you know, think of that task, and, and uh, I'm not sure that uh, that's an easy task to take on. It said a large crowd trailed behind, including many grief-stricken women. But Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me. Don't weep for me. And there's a couple things going on. I'm going to take chase a little rabbit, and then we'll get back to what Jesus was truly talking about. But Jesus said, don't weep for me. Don't be sorrowful for me. I'm doing what my Father commanded me. It's not something to be sorrow. What, what should they be? They should be victorious, right? They should be excited that this is actually happening, right? That's a hard thing, though, isn't it? You consider it all joy when you face trials. You know, there's that James thing in there again. It says, man, that's hard to do. Don't weep for me. Christ's journey to the cross was for us, his victory over our enemies. I'm doing this for you. Our sorrow should be for ourselves. We should recognize it was for us, for the forgiveness of our sins. Sometimes we don't have the right perspective, do we? And in that statement, Christ helped to refocus the perspective of those. He said, but weep for yourselves and for your children, for the days are coming when they will say, fortunate indeed are the women who are childless, the wombs that have not borne a child and the breasts that have, not, have never nursed. People will beg for the mountains fall on us and plead with the hills, bury us. For if these things are done when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Well, that's an awful lot to say, <laughs> right? What, do you think he meant something? He certainly did. Well, actually here he was talking about 70 A.D. 70 A.D., the fall of Jerusalem. Rome destroyed Jerusalem in 70 A.D. And what did they do? They 
that killed everybody. Everybody. And he's saying there's going to come a time you wish you were dead. You're mourning your children. You wish you never had the kids that are being killed. I mean, uh, I, I think it was Kevin Jehoshaphat or Jehoshaphat. I, it wasn't Joseph and it wasn't Jehoshaphat. There's a name in between. There was a Josephus. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. You even drank ventriloquist today. Wow. You are amazing. Oh, that's right. I'm, I apologize for, for asking you a question and you don't have your voice. And um, wrote the history. And, and if we look in that history, they estimate that over a million people died. That the, and there's, there's reports that the Romans had to climb over the bodies to get to the other people to kill them. The fall of Jerusalem was coming. 70, 80, 70 years after this, every man, woman, and child would be killed as the Romans destroyed the city. If the innocent Christ can be crucified... How bad will it be when there is no one to turn to? That's what he meant when the tree was green. If I'm here and I'm present and, and the nation of Israel hasn't embraced me, how bad is it going to get for you? How terrible is it going to get for you? If the tree's green and this can happen, they can crucify an innocent man, how bad is it going to be when I'm not here? How bad is it when God sends the Messiah and you don't receive the Messiah, and then you turn to God for help, well, what's God going to say? What's, what, what's God going to say? They never knew. That's Don't weep for me. <laughs> don't wait. Pay attention to what's going on. Pay attention to what's going on. Two others, both criminals, were let out to be executed with him. When the they came to the place called the skull. They nailed him to the cross, and the criminals were also crucified, one on his right and one on his left. I don't know if this is where we get left and right in politics, but, <laughs> but, but there's only two ways, folks. There's only two choices in life. And it's illustrated. Christ is in the middle. And you can be on the side that honors God, or you can be on the side that honors yourself. That's it. There's no in-between. There's no Our motive boiled down to that. We either are motivated to honor God and do things and respond in ways that honor God, or we're serving ourselves. And everything we do is for us. We can give to God what's right, or we can give to God what's left. And most times, God's an afterthought, isn't it? Sometimes in our lives, we get to the point where we get so deep into something, we turn around and say, Lord, help me. And God said, well, maybe you should have asked me back here. And, and that's a lot like what he was trying to tell to the women who were weeping. Turn to me now while I'm here. Turn to me while I can be found. Seek the Lord while he can be found. So these two thieves, good guys, right? Probably not. Why, why do we know they're probably not good guys? They were being crucified. Capital punishment. <laughs> they were murderous thieves, and the town decided that we would rather, that, that for their transgressions they needed to be killed. All right. We have to understand that because they weren't the only innocent person that was being crucified here was Christ. It wasn't these guys weren't accused falsely. They they weren't being put on the cross because they didn't deserve to be there. It wasn't an oversight by some magistrate and you know they they accidentally ended up there. It's important to know that they deserved to be there. And they understood that. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. Again, Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. What didn't they understand? 
a lot. <laughs> a lot. A lot. And, and even in his pain and suffering, even in his distress, what is his nature? Forgiving and grace. Think about, think about you. Okay, and this is rhetorical. I don't need any, any testimony, but when you're under pressure, how do you respond? <laughs> what, what comes to the surface? What, what do other people see? Man, I wish it was grace. <laughs> I wish it was mercy, but I'm telling you, you put me under pressure sometimes, it, it's ugly. It's ugly, because what's in there? What's in there? So when you put somebody under pressure and, and in this position, what are we going to see? We're going to see their true character. And I can share with you that when we're under pressure, our true nature rises to the surface. Our old nature, that sin nature, that, that nature that wants to get mad and get even, and, and that's what rises to the surface. What rose to the surface for Christ? Forgiveness, grace, mercy. He was truly, that had to communicate something to somebody, right? We know, we know later that one of the guards was paying attention, don't we? Because Christ acted in a way that what? Was so different than anybody else. And here's Christ. Father, forgive them. For they know not what to do. They don't quite understand it yet. And the soldiers what? Gambled for his clothes, right? Gambled for his clothes. I don't think he had much, but but uh, there's other Gospels that fill in some of the blanks for us. I won't ruin the story. We'll look at John's Gospel next. Do we understand what the cost of our forgiveness? I know that doesn't read right, and I didn't want to edit it after I proofread it. And I said, well, we're going to go with bad English. Do we understand what the cost was of our forgiveness? Yeah, I know, but you know what? We stood here tonight and, and, and already today and said it's hard to comprehend, isn't it? It's hard to even get your hands around what it cost. What it cost for our forgiveness. What's more difficult to get our hands around is that he, Christ knew and he knew we didn't know. And he did it anyway. He knew. And he did it. How many of us sometimes count the cost too much? Too much to reach out to somebody. Too much to, to do something for somebody. You know, we, we look at the balance sheet and we determine that, ah, you know, that's, that's, I, I could lose something here. I could lose something. How can we begin to comprehend what he did on the cross? How can we? What are, what are some of the ways that, think about that as we reflect to that cross. What can we do that will help us understand what he did for us? That's where the rubber hits the road. That's where we get out of our comfort zone. That's where we get into that area that we have to depend on God. Why? We'll start to understand what Christ went through for us. We'll start to understand how much it cost. Is there, and let me, you know, help us here. Is there, is there too great a cost for someone else's life? No. <laughs> the answer is no. There's no great, there's no, there's no cost too great. How do we know that? Christ set the standard. Christ set the standard. He didn't say, I'm just gonna do this for these people over here because they're good and they, you know, they try real hard and they do good. They mess up sometimes, but but these people over here, they're not worth they're not worth it. And this isn't for them. That's not what he did, did he? He, he did it for everyone, right? 
What is God's desire? That all would be saved, right? Isn't that what the Word says? Right? All, three letters, tells us there's no life that isn't worthy of Christ's sacrifice. Goes on, the crowd watched and the leaders scoffed. He saved others, they said. Let him save himself if he's really God's Messiah, the chosen one. Who's, who's saying this? Who's saying this? Who's voicing this? The priests, the Pharisees, the, the Jewish leaders. Man, that's, that's you know, they, they weren't listening. <laughs> you know, there, there were some of them that said, yeah, you might want to, you might want to, but these guys were, they were fired up, weren't they? They fired up the crowds. Pilate says, I found no guilt with this man. And they, they yelled, crucify, crucify. And they carried it right to the cross. He saved others. They said, let him save himself if he's really God's Messiah, the chosen. I'm not sure I'm quite that bold. I know we have to be bold for the gospel, but I'm not sure I'm bold enough to challenge God that way. It says the soldiers mocked him. Now, I would expect the soldiers to mock him, but I would expect some degree of maybe he really is the Messiah. But they were blinded, weren't they? The teachers, the, the leaders, they were blinded, weren't they? They let, they let things get in the way of seeing the hand of God, didn't they? The soldiers mocked him too by offering a drink of sour wine. They called out to him, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. A sign was fastened above him with these words, this is the king of the Jews. How did that go over with the religious leaders? They did not like it because we didn't. he's not the king of the Jews. Pilate says, well, that's what you said, not me. <laughs> I'm just putting his charge because they always put a, a plaque on a on the cross to say what they were charged with. And he was charged with being the king of the Jews. And and Pilate put it in several languages so they so everybody would know and and you know um but uh one of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed. So oh, you're the Messiah. <laughs> Are you? You're the Messiah? <laughs> Prove it. Prove it. Prove it. Now, let the record show in a couple verses Christ proved it. Prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. Save yourself. Hey, give it time. Give me, give me three days. I'll, I'll, I'll get it. Give me three days, not today. How many times do we want God's timing now? If you're God, prove it. God, I need this right here, right now. Prove it. God, if you're in this situation, show up. Do something. We do that, don't we? We're, we're no different. We're no different. If you're really God, you do this. God says, give me time. I'll take care of it. And I'm going to do it my way. But the other criminal protest is, don't you even fear God? Did the leaders fear God? Not by their words, did they? They weren't fearing God. I, I don't know, man. I, I, I've lived this life enough to know that there is a God, and I'm not him. <laughs> I fear God. And truth be told, all of us come to a point in our life where we fear God. It may be on our deathbed, and we may be looking for help, but we, we will come. Why? Because the book says every knee will bow and every tongue confess. The best option is to do it here. Because if you do it there, it doesn't count. Okay, you will kneel and confess, but it's too late at that point. 
when you die, you will meet God. And he's either going to welcome you in or cast you out. We can choose. We can choose. Don't you fear God? When you have been sentenced to die? That's an interesting thing, right? We, what was that saying? There's no atheists in foxholes. There's no atheists on deathbeds. And even the greatest atheist there ever was reached out to know about God on her deathbed. It's all fun and games until what? Somebody's life is on the line. And when that life is yours, I want every option I can get to have hope, to have peace. We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. Where did this thief get this idea from? Folks, thieves no thieves. Okay, crooks no crooks. Okay, crooks can spot crooks. Okay, they know their own. They could look at this guy. No, no, he's not one of us. He's not like this. They, they, he knew this is. This, he's not here because of anything he did. We're here because of what we did, and we're here because we did it. But not him. He hasn't done anything. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Acknowledge God, right? Acknowledge God. And, and in this statement, this man decided that he would fear God and he would acknowledge God and he would call out to the other. Now, he had nothing to lose, folks. And sometimes witnessing about Christ is easy when we don't have anything to lose, right? Let me ask you a question. Who has something to lose by witnessing about Christ? Guess what? Christ took care of it. We don't have anything to lose, do we? We don't. He took care of it. He said, trust me, do it. You ain't got nothing to lose. I covered it. You're still going to be with me in paradise. Don't worry. You got nothing, and anything you got, I can replace. You doubt that? Just ask that guy there, Job. Anything you got, I can replace. Right? Got nothing to lose. Just think of yourself as a thief on that cross. Because why? Because our transgressions deserve what? Death. Right? Our transgressions deserve death. And what did Christ do? He gave us life. He gave us life. We got nothing to lose, folks. We got nothing to lose. And Jesus said, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. Oh, he proved who he was. He proved we were. Do you remember that transaction that took place in one of, early in one of the Gospels where they lowered the paralytic in front of Jesus? And Jesus said, Son, your sins are forgiven. It's exactly what he's saying to the thief on the cross. And the next words out of Christ's mouth would be, So that you know that I have the power to forgive sins, come by the tomb in three days. Tell me what you see. Come by and check it out. See who's there. Right? Just like he told the parallel to get up and walk. He says, you come by and in three days, all your questions will be answered. All the insults you hurl at me right now will be answered. All the questions, if you're the Messiah, save yourself, will be answered. You just come by that tomb in three days. Right? I assure you, you with her. Man, there isn't any better words to hear. There isn't any better thing that Christ could say, especially when you're on a cross being crucified. I don't know, but I'm pretty sure he was smiling. 
I'm pretty sure there was a peace in his heart. And I'm pretty sure he was full of joy when he heard those words from Christ. Right? Christ said some pretty significant things on the cross. We would do well to respond. Amen?